So we'll go ahead and start our introduction and our, um, Matt, if you could move to the next slide. So let's just go over a little bit about what the call is going to be about. We do have a speaker today, Dr. Shukla. He is the Associate Professor and Director of Advanced CKD Program and Director of Home Dialysis Program at the University of Florida. His topic is going to be about home dialysis and COVID-19 pandemic, a better sweet com combo. Um, we do want to hear from you today. Everybody is uh, was muted on when they got into the um, webinar today, but we do want to hear from you. And so if you can, please submit any questions through the chat. We really appreciate it. We will have some time at the end of the presentation for to answer some of those questions. Next slide. So um, what is this call about? Um, our calls, we want to hear from stakeholders and peers in the ESRD community who are adopting to this time of COVID-19. We're going to be sharing examples and provide real-world strategies for facilities to use. And we are going to be engaging in weekly calls on various topics. Next slide. Um, I do see that Dr. Shukla is connected. Dr. Shukla, can you hear me OK? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Perfect. Great. Just perfect timing. Um, let me just give a little introduction about Dr. Shukla. As I mentioned, he is the Associate Professor and Director of the Advanced Chronic Kidney Disease and Home Dialysis Program with the Division of Nephrology at the University of Florida and a staff physician with the North Florida South Georgia Veterans Healthcare System. He also serves as the chairperson of the National Veterans Administration Peritoneal Dialysis Workgroup and the co-chair of the VA Peritoneal Dialysis Choice, Access, and Quality Workgroups. So I'm going to, um, Dr. Shukla, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, Matt will be advancing your slides, so as you just need to, just please say next slide. I thought that if it was a little bit late, uh, and and I truly apologize. I have an invasion in the home as we get ad adjusted to this new reality of life. Uh, apparently, there are some people delivering some, and I've told them not to interrupt. So hopefully, everything will go fine. But let's go ahead and go to the next slide, and I'll give my introduction here. Uh, so today, what I'm going to talk about is I think every one of us has gone through this tremendously sort of unique experience over the last six months. And in many ways, I think all of us have actually learned what to do on the go. So on the first month that the things happened, I think all of us had to adjust. We had to absorb the information as it was coming through from CDC and other governmental organizations and then adapt it to our programs as we go, go along. And I think to some extent what I saw during those times was uh, there was no right or wrong way of doing things. We just had to make up our own policies to go along in the safest manner possible for our patient. And then somewhere along the line, I think uh, CDC and governmental organizations and then American Society of Nephrology, National uh, the Dialysis Organization like NCTS and CDC itself came up with dialysis-related uh, sort of recommendation. So then it started helping us much more. And as this help came along, we realized that the most of the help was directed towards what we have a, a dominant modality, which is in-center modality uh, of dialysis. And at home place, we were a little bit behind the curve in terms of the help that we are going to get. Having said that, I think we all were lucky as well, because as you all know, the home dialysis has substantial advantages in terms of uh, uh, avoiding traveling and exposure to society. So I think in some ways we were helped by the nature of what we do, uh, and, and we had a little bit more time to adjust to ourselves. Anyway, with this sort of introduction, uh, let me give you the outline, as you can see, I'm going to very briefly talk about the advantages of home dialysis. Uh, most of it are quite intuitive. Uh, I'm going to talk about the concerns and cautions for home dialysis, uh, and that is more from the pragmatic or practical aspect as to what we need to do. I'll talk about practice of home dialysis, and that is mainly from the perspective of what we are doing and how we are adapting 
our local recommendation in terms of hospital recommendation to the CDC recommendation. And then finally, I'll give some idea about what are the re resources that we can use in terms of uh, going forward or if we have any questions. Next slide, please. So as you all know, the epidemiology of ESRD in COVID uh, infection is sort of, it's going on and there is, there is an ongoing update as the publications come along. The majority of the publication that we are currently following came from China as well as Europe. And these were the epidemiological sort of paper. And then there were other papers then from United States that sort of joined the available data to give us some idea as to how in US situation, uh, Oh, okay, sorry, there was a question going on. Somewhere. From the US situation, which are the sort of applicable uh, conditions or how we differ from what we are seeing outside the United States? So as you all know, ESRD population is at high risk because of one, multiple comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, CKD by itself is a high risk condition, and then concerns for immunosuppression, and the patients require medical care way more frequently than non-CKD patients. Next. And so the chances for these people to get infection, next please. Uh, so the chances for these people to get infection is higher. There are no well-published studies. So few studies have been reported and you can see on the right-hand side lower corner, there were studies from China, Europe, and some from the United States. And if you see the incident COVID-19 rates, this is an in-center hemodialysis population, was about two and a half to 20%. This was a wide variation. And as you all can understand, the, if there is an outbreak in a unit, then the given unit may have a higher chances of COVID-19. And if there is no outbreak and the precautions and other things are different, then the unit may have lower chances of uh, COVID-19 infection. And because of this, based on where the unit is located, metropolitan versus rural area, what are their inherent rate of COVID transmission in the community is, there are different rate of published incident rate of uh, COVID-19 uh, occurrence in hemodialysis patient. In home dialysis, unfortunately, we do not have good data as to what the incidence or prevalence rate is I can tell you in my unit till now, uh, we have had one patient who had COVID-19. We had one patient who had, who was on a respite care to uh, in-center unit for backup hemodialysis, and he got COVID-19 and currently is very sick and admitted. So it's just an anecdote of one unit, but it gives you an idea that it's very home dialysis patient if they're forming, following the guidelines, it is related to their preserved or protected from getting COVID-19. People with ESRD, when they get symptoms, it's a wide range of symptoms. And as you know, ESRD comes in wide flavor. So some people have relatively immune and intact immune status. And because of that, their response to COVID-19 is different than compared to somebody who is inherently at greater sickness level. And if you see it from that perspective, the reported symptoms are mild asymptomatic case, and there are few uh, hemodialysis units which have done screening protocol and shown that somewhere around 15% or so of their patients were asymptomatic positive patients. Whereas on the other side, as we all know, CKD is a rec recognized high risk complication group. And so because of that, uh, there, is a, there is a rapid deterioration in severe COVID-19 presentation as well there. Whether it is a low risk or low symptom population, the mortality of COVID-19 has been reported pretty high for CKD population. So conventional population mortality is about 2%. And if you, this is, you see all comers, but if you see in ESID population, it is reported to be about 30%. And so overall, if you see that the COVID-19 is reported lower, though these are anecdotal reports in home dialysis populations. 
Next slide, please. So because of this, a number of organizations, and these are a few articles that have been published, and there are a few journals which have been published, and a number of people have raised the concern that COVID-19, in the era of COVID-19, the importance of home dialysis has been emphasized further that these patients are more protected compared to the conventional in-center dialysis population. Next slide, please. So, and obviously the inherent advantage of home dialysis in COVID-19 is that they, have, they can obviously avoid uh, visits to healthcare facility. They do not have to get exposed to other patients who are more vulnerable. They don't get exposed to healthcare workers. And I think healthcare workers are especially important because one of us getting infected has a much greater chance of being passing it on to others. So they don't have to get exposed to healthcare workers. And then lastly, because of the independence of lifestyle, in fact, my patients right now are doing their Zoom and clinic visit from their backyard and from their pool areas. So it is those kind of protection that inherently suggests that home dialysis patients are protected from COVID-19 or do have a little bit extra protection layer compared to a conventional dialysis patient. Next slide, please. So going further, how do we give care to these patients? Well, if you say our goals of care, they are very simple. We have to give safe to keep the safety of patient, staff, and facility in mind. We have to establish efficient triaging and reporting role for our staff. And we have to ensure that facility continues to provide higher standards of care. And these are general goals of care for home dialysis inside or outside COVID-19 pandemic period. In COVID-19 period, on the right-hand side, as I have written, there are pragmatic concerns. In addition to cater to the goals of care, we have certain pragmatic concerns, which is when we provide care, there are multiple processes that we follow. And when we follow these processes, we, as a, as a, as a provider, cannot... Uh, my apologies, uh, this is the home invasion part I was talking about. So that we as providers have these pragmatic concerns that each step of our, uh, this thing, what are the kind of things that we need to do? So we need to initiate our patients on dialysis. We need to have a routine follow-up of our these patients on dialysis. And we also need to have procedures in lab. Give me one second, I'm so sorry. If you can get me the pen, please, I'll sign it. Okay. We have to maintain that supply lines, and we have to take care of the social and economic burdens. I'm going to cover each of these issues, so Matt, you can go to the next slide, and then I'll cover this later when I talk to them. So, in order to initiate the patient on dialysis, we need to have a new patient initiation. So, in the month of March or April, we had to go through the, the, this particular concerns at each of, for each of our patients. So, for example, patient selection, initiation of the patient procedure, and then training procedure. Next slide, please. Now, you all know that in order for patients to choose home dialysis, we need to provide education to home dialysis. And this is a bunch of graphs that I have shown you, but this is a bunch of study, each couplet represents a study, and you can see that when you provide education to patients, more patients choose home dialysis. And I don't think this is a new graph. I think, you know, this data is from Spain, the first graph. The second couplet is from Asia. The third couplet is from Netherlands. Fourth couplet on, from left-hand side is from Austria. And the fifth couplet is the United States data and each of them, if you see the green, the top versions, in CPE, which is the comprehensive patient education, more people, when you provide comprehensive patient education, more people choose home dialysis therapy. This is not a new knowledge that I'm saying. In fact, on the right-hand side, you see these four thick bars that I have shown. That's our own data, and there are a, there are a series of publications, and all four are education-based uh, publications. 
So if you see our home dialysis rate in our cities have been somewhere between 53 to 76 <clears> percent. <throat> so what I'm trying to say here is that when we provide education, more patients choose home dialysis therapy. Next slide, please. And that is not a new thing that I am saying, right? Nearly half of patients choose home dialysis if there is a comprehensive education provided. Unfortunately, most of the time, we are unable to provide this education. Why? Well, because half of the patients don't reach nephrologists before ESRD. Amongst those who reach nephrologists, few practices themselves have provision or facility to provide kidney disease education. And even among the facilities that provide kidney disease education, uh, they very much select people who are more likely to select start home dialysis therapy. So they only provide education to those patients. Please close the door. So, and what ended up happening in this particular pandemic, and this was our main concern, and I'll show you, that as soon as the pandemic started, the first thing that got sacrificed was kidney disease education. So when everything went to emergency measures, the kidney disease education got thrown to the backside. And because of that, next, next, week, next slide. And because of that, a lot of our patients were otherwise going to get educated and would have selected home dialysis, or the patients who did select home dialysis but could not come to our clinic for transition care ended up being started on incentive dialysis. So it almost people reflexively went back to their comfort zone practice and force of practice just kept on bringing more and more people with incentive dialysis. So we decided that kidney disease education was very important, that it needs to continue. And so we wanted to continue it, and we established this telemedicine clinic right within that first month of COVID-19 pandemic. So somewhere in the March, by the end of the March, we had already established a clinic. Next slide, please. And when, but before I go there, we were comfortable doing that part because we had done a study before where this is one study. On the left-hand side, it shows that compared to face-to-face -to -face education, right and side, uh, it shows the telemedicine-based education. How, what was the proportion of people choosing home form of dialysis therapy? And about 7, 50, 60 to 70 percent on both sides were choosing home dialysis therapy. And on the right hand side, we asked the patient that once you have gotten education, how confident are you that what you are choosing is something that you would like? And close to about 96 to 98 percent of people felt that they were equally comfortable. So by the end of three sessions of education, it was quite equal. And if you see these graphs are pretty good there together. So we knew that providing dialysis education by telemedicine was going to be sufficient for, to continue our patient education effort. Next slide, please. So we actually continued doing this throughout this COVID exposure pandemic, except for the earlier first month or so. So for example, our activities for education stopped on March 17. We restarted, including the clinic visits, the Zoom-based clinic visit, by April 23rd. And by now, we have had a number of patients who have gone through education. And I can show you this on the right-hand side. The circle that you are seeing is actual our data from the COVID pandemic time. These are the kidney disease education data. And what we can show you is that about 50% of people chose peritoneal dialysis on this education. 40% didn't show up. And about 20% uh, chose in-center hemodialysis. So if you remember, compared to this bar graph that I'm showing on the left-hand side in the middle, if you see that somewhere around 50% of patients choosing home dialysis therapy on the right-hand side, on the Florida side, it roughly looks about same, that we have 50% of total, or about 70% of those who came for education or who attended education chose home dialysis therapy. So again, this just validates that providing kidney disease education by Zoom is not 
inferior to actually or is way better than not providing education at all during this particular pandemic. Next slide, please. So then we had to talk about the pre-initiation procedures. And I'm talking about the majority of part here about peritoneal dialysis. But remember, this is equally applicable for hemodialysis. So the hemo is a hybrid between PD and home hemodialysis, except for longer, uh, or sorry, in-center hemodialysis, except for longer requirement for training. So for most of the part, this will be applicable to home hemodialysis as well. And so one of the things that happened when they initially canceled all the non-essential surgeries, we had a couple of patients who had to postpone their PD, PD catheter insertion surgery for a few weeks. And we were concerned about this. So we actually met with our surgeon and we suggested that these are emergency procedures. So we need to proceed with that. By the time we scheduled the first patient for PD catheter surgery, by that time, CMS and American Society of Nephrology also came out with saying that PD catheter insertion is an essential emergency procedure and should not be deferred during pandemic. So that really helped us out. Next slide. So throughout this COVID, most of the place now have picked up the PD catheter surgery, but we have never actually stopped it. So we were able to continue PD catheter insertion throughout the pandemic without any delay. We did have delays in terms of PD catheter insertion, but that was not related to the procedural aspect. It was more related to the fact that people were uncomfortable by doing Zoom clinic for CKD care. So they would not show up for our CKD care clinic visit. And hence, we would not be able to schedule them with the surgeons to come in for a PD catheter insertion. But other than that, we haven't sacrificed much. The main sacrifice has occurred or main harm to the patients have occurred when they could not attend any clinic and they had to come straight to the hospital to emergency room and be initiated on in-center dialysis. Next slide, please. And finally, the training. And this one we discussed right in the beginning of our pandemic. And now again, International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis as well as CMS has guidelines for training, both for PD and home hemodialysis. And the general consensus is that training for home dialysis can continue. Next slide, please. However, when we do do the training, we take special precaution. In general, PD training is easier than home hemodialysis, principally because it is a shorter training. But we follow the following principles we usually do not postpone training. If there are special concerns from staffing or patient side, you can go across, go along with just manual training, which is CAPD training. Since manual training is pretty quick, that usually allows the patient to be self-sufficient. We have not had to do that. We have our staff, in fact, affection has never been that we could not do our APD training. But if one had to choose, you could choose a flexible APD training, which is sort of hybrid. So it is possible many a time we do this for our hemo patient, and it is easy to do for PD patient also, that if you have, let's say, a couple of patients starting together at the same time, and you could not do both the patient training because of your staff scarcity or staff affection, you could do them alternate day training. This way you would be able to provide them some training, some dialysis so you could extend the training hours or make training short and do in-center sort of in -center peritoneal dialysis more equivalent to IPD or intermittent peritoneal dialysis. And the third thing you can do is you can shift some of your training, especially which is about reviewing the infection control protocol and some of the educational material that you have to give. You can convert it to telemedicine and that gives you a little bit more flexibility in doing the training. We have put in these contingencies for our unit. We have been lucky enough that our nurses have actually stayed healthy and we have not had staff related problem, as much staff related problem as we have heard from some of the other units. Next slide, please. 
In general, during training, we follow full PPE precaution. So in general, for the patient visit, what we say is that everybody should be masked, social distancing should be followed. But while the patients are being trained, we usually recommend that PP, full PPE should be worn. So our nurses actually don N95 masks. They also use shield or goggles, and they use full gown to do the training. Especially since training is likely to be in a smaller room, it's usually in closed setting. These are usually important parameters to ensure that there is no transmission. We also recommend cleaning the room at the end of each day so that no exposure occurs to either other nurses or other patients visiting. Cleaning crew, we, we, our cleaning crew is specially informed by the nurse manager to ensure that the supplies and all of those area, the, the, the antiseptics, the antibacterials, the supplies are all stocked. They are recommended supplies, and especially that the cleaning crew normally may not be cleaning or paying attention to the high touch area. The nurse manager, we, we did this in the initial part where we do uh, these training of the supply crew just to make sure that they have not, that there is no frequent change of staff or there is no significant surprises on the next day that somebody forgot to clean a particular room or something. Like we have shifted some of our training to video assisted or Zoom based training. And when we do home visit, actually for the last three months or so, we have shifted most of our visits home visits to telemedicine-based visits. This actually allows us to do two things. One, we can review the Zoom clinic procedures with the patient during training, because we have seen that's a big problem. Many of our patients don't know how to open Zoom, don't know how to start the microphone, don't know how to start the video. So we can do that revision, they can bring that equipment, we show them how to do the Zoom training or Zoom conferencing. And so the first time we do the home visit, we can review that so that by the time you have a problem occurring or a physician or nurse's visit occurring, the patients are already well versed in the procedures. Next slide, please. So now that I have talked about initiation of the patient, I'm going to talk about the routine follow-up care of the home dialysis. Happy? Next slide. The routine care is basically divided into two things in our clinic. The general principle during the lockdown was that unless a patient requires an in-person visit, we will not have an in-person visit except for every third month. Otherwise, we will continue with telemedicine-based visit. One of the other criteria that we had given was that any patient deemed unsuitable for telemedicine visit on nursing, which is any patient with fluid related issue, uncontrolled blood pressure, or electrolyte or other symptoms during the visit, that normally on nursing visit, nurses could not deal with. Those visits we have actually converted in, into in-person visit. So my standing instruction to the nurses are that if there is any doubt, convert it into in-person visit. If you feel comfortable managing this on phone, then we can have a medicine-based visit. It is still possible that in my in-person visit, if a person is unstable, I'll ask the person to come over to the clinic. But in general, employing this strategy, since home dialysis nurses are usually very well versed with the with the with the triaging aspect of the patient. Usually we have not had problems except for one or two patients who had fluid related issues and we had to bring them in. We also had to talk at least in the earlier part about the use or reuse of PPE. It is good that now our supply chains have established well. So because of that, we are not needing as much uh, reuse of PPE. So all patients have been given cloth masks, and nowadays there are so many designer masks that I'm seeing patients wearing those masks all the time, even on my Zoom and in-person visit. Next slide, please. <coughs> so 
And I think I, I, I did say a lot of this in the previous slide. Yes, most patients can be managed by Zoom visit. Intensity of follow-up and for in-person individualized. The good thing is that CMS has facilitated expanded use of telemedicine visit. And this, I really found it very helpful. Uh, actually, Michelle, who is my nurse manager, found it tremendously helpful in arranging this telemedicine visit because we had clear idea as to what to expect from the patient as well. By the time CMS accepted uh, these particular expanded criteria, we already had started Zoom visit from our university health center perspective. So we actually as providers were a little bit more comfortable doing the telemedicine visit. And that helped out further in terms of giving patients the comfort. We do have some patients with AMIA, uh, that is the Baxter's uh, remote monitoring uh, cycler. And in those patients, it's even easier to manage the prescription, especially the change of prescription in terms of change of cycle or the strength of the bag. We could communicate these things much easier with the patient. Next slide, please. The CMS has further allowed, sort of facilitated uh, many of the concerns related to home dialysis visits are not uh, related to the fact that we cannot manage it, but have been related to the payment aspect of it. That regulatory bodies require a fair bit of documentation and payment in order for us to provide care. Thus, if you see practice of home dialysis in Canada, for example, country where your reimbursement is not directly connected to your monthly documentation, versus in the United States where it is directly connected to your monthly documentation, it's, they are different. So, for example, in Canada, when I used to practice, it was not uncommon that I would see a patient every alternate or every third month. But in the United States, I have to see a patient every month. The good thing was that as the COVID sort of pandemic occurred, CMS recognized this particular problem and helped substantially relax the consideration for what will be allowed or more appropriately, what can be, what waivers can allow you to function providing care without worrying about documentation. And so, these things have actually further increased our use of telemedicine. One of the easiest, and you can read here a number of things that I have written here, but one of the things that I found the very helpful is these HIPAA waiver for some of the popular items, which is FaceTime, and then we have Doximity Dialer, which I have found it tremendously easy to use because many a time I have seen that Zoom does not work out for patient, and for one or the other reason, they are not able to click either the video or audio, or there is a software requirement or something. Even though it is very user-friendly, there are problems. The Doximity Dialer actually just sends them a text, and it actually is a fully HIPAA compliant. So not only in my dialysis unit, I have, we also use this commonly, both at university as well as VA, and all I have to do is send the patient a FaceTime invitation, which is essentially a call that you make it using the Doximity Dialer. Patient receives a text, and all they have to do is click, and when the app opens or web app opens, it opens with all the functionality open so that they don't have to go through approval or not. And so it allows us to do the visit, and patient doesn't get stuck with, you can't hear them, you can't see them. So all of these things have allowed us more easier use of telehealth. There's still a problem, I'll tell you, but it has become tremendously easy. In fact, I and my colleagues and in fact, many on national scene routinely say that if it was not for COVID, the telehealth would not have occurred. What we probably would have achieved over the next four to six to 10 years we have achieved in about four to four or five months. Next slide, please. So we use telehealth for training. We use for home visit. We use for monthly education. We use for everything that does not require a patient to touch anything. 
and we use it for supplies and technology direction. So almost everything that we do, we have now decided we are going to do at least in the current phase on telemedicine. Where do we not use telemedicine? Next slide, please. That's mainly when there are problems. So apart from that quarterly visit, there are some people either have difficulty connecting to video call. And again, a part of this has to do with the payment, but difficulty connecting to the video call. Or I have a couple, couple of patients who are really, really concerned that their privacy is being invaded by video call. So they don't want to do video call. So these are the people who we still have to ask for. Either we do audio call visit, which is just telephone-based visit, and currently we do have approval for just audio being reimbursed at the same level as audio video, but we are not sure how long that is going to last. We still allow the patients to do that, even though it reduces our reimbursement. And then every alternate or third month, we make it in-person visit. If the person has an infectious complication, we usually ask them to come in. The most important is that now peritonitis is usual people will come in. Exit site, I have been asked multiple times, do I really need to get the patient in or can I just go ahead and provide treatment? The concern with exit site infection many a time is you cannot rule out the tunnel infection or tunnel abscess with exit site infection. So because of that, I am particularly concerned that if you can safely achieve, we usually do ask people to come in. If there is an overriding reason that they cannot come in, we have occasionally approved an empirical course of antibiotic just based on video visit. I have some people who have either fluid or cardiovascular reason. So one of the patients gained about 10 kilograms, which is 22 pounds weight. And that was just principally related to him not feeling well and not doing his dialysis. But because of the COVID, and I'll, I'll talk about this, because of the COVID, those communications sometimes suffer. So I actually, in his case, had to make him come in and go through entire thing one more time in terms of review, just to understand that we are on the same page. We were not getting the satisfaction on a telemedicine visit. Next slide, please. What do we do for in-person visit? I'm, try, I'm not going to go through this. In general, this is our process, and I've given this so that most people can read it. But in general, this is our process. We have a standalone home dialysis unit. So for us, <clears throat> it is easier to have patient wait in their vehicle. We have a standalone home dialysis unit in a, in a, in a shopping mall type of thing. It's not an actual mall. They are individual buildings, but patients have ample parking space just outside the unit. Because of that, they can have their AC on and they can still sit in their cars and vehicles, even in the heat. So what we tell them is when you reach the clinic, call us. One of us will come out to the door, will screen you, will do the temperature screening, and then get you in. Till that time, you will just sit in the car once we come out, please come to the door. And it has worked very well for us. We have essentially waived off the entire waiting room concept. So our waiting room currently stays locked. In fact, all the chairs are locked, except for two areas where we do CKD education, which are widely separated. And only two families at a time or two patient units at a time can come and sit there. Once we take the, so we do not take anybody who has screening positive or temperature in the unit. If they do have either screening positive or temperature, they have to go back, either contact their primary care or we have our ER right next door. So they contact them, get the COVID negative test, and then they are allowed to come in. Or they will inform me or one of my colleagues who are the providers and say, if we will figure out as to how we can get these things tested. But in general, the staff will not come in contact with anybody who is COVID positive, suspected COVID positive, or screen positive, or PUI, person under investigation, as we call it. Next slide, please. 
Once they are in, we usually take them straight to the room, so there is no contact of patients with the surrounding. All my staff, uh, we have, um, and I don't know, some of your units may have done. So for example, our healthcare facility has given us NFI, so we are providers for nurses and the physician. They have given us five and 95 masks that we need to reuse. So what we do is we do a practice of one mask for each day. And once we wear it, we basically keep it on except for the time when we go out of the patient unit. What, and so essentially we recircle, so the Monday mask will then go on shelf for that particular person, for that particular nurse or doctor. And then that person or doctor will pick up the mask next Monday. Till that time, the mask is not reused. Usually it says that in about 48 hours, the, these surfaces again become sterile or at least without COVID. So it's easier or safer to use without that. There are some units which do not have adequate supply that have used autoclave or some other process for mask sterilization. In general, we have not had to use it, but one could use it. Our screening protocol are CDC-based protocol, but I'll show you there is a mild variation. So we have a specific variation. And that's pr principally because I work at University of Florida. So we have our guidelines and protocols for how to triage different people in terms of uh, whether they are exposed, infected, suspected, whatnot. And so what we do is that we follow the local protocol. And I would recommend that in general, all facilities should try and see if there is an easily accessible local protocol. Because the local protocols have an advantage, especially for with the institutes of higher learning, that they can actually tailor it to the requirements of the local place, which is how prevalent and how endemic COVID situation is. Next slide, please. I think I covered this. Next slide, please. Okay, so what do we do about the special procedures and lab? Next slide. In general, our in general, our principle here is that if it is not required for patient safety and patient care, we try to do it at a time when it is safe to do. Obviously, now we have realized. So initial part, first month or two, we actually postponed our PET test and the transfer state exchange by a month or so. Now we have realized that none of us are getting out of this for the next six months, eight months, so we cannot postpone it anymore. So now what we are doing is we are triaging it so that we can get in those patients who require either a PET test or a transfer state exchange on those days where we do not expect other visitors to come in. So usually minimum amount of nursing staff, minimum amount of patients, and those are the days we usually have those patients come in. Obviously, whenever the patient come in for either those things or any other thing, we require everyone to wear full PPE. Usually patients wear conventional surgical masks and the nurses and the staff wear face shield and N95. Our coffee plants are fully tele-based or the Zoom-based. And uh, I haven't even seen my dietitian or social worker for last four months now. And our medicine packet pickup have become passive. So we do not ask patients to sign. Two nurses or two staff will sign the thing. So because of these, it's much easier for us to sort of keep interaction with patient to the minimum. Our lab procedures are very brief and short. So the patient will come get a lab done and the rest of the things, we continue to do it on phone. Next slide. Our nurse manager, and uh, I must give her special credit and thanks for this particular thing. Our nurse manager uh, does regular infection control audits. Uh, my apologies, uh, for some reason, I've written it intensive care, but it's an infection control audit. Uh, we, she, there's a bunch of things just to make sure that even the staff interaction is minimized. In fact, our primary nursing area 
now has been divided so that each person sits in a different room. So conventionally, if the patients are not there, the nurses will use the exam room for their work so that there is no congregation of the people, personnel in the central area. And we have special procedures for PUI or other positive patient tracking. And our one unit currently, it's happening through corporate because it's a DCI-based unit. In the second one, it's a nurse, in nurse manager's job to do this particular tracking. We, the nurse manager is instructed to, for the corporate, they're saying every week or twice a week, they have conference calls, so the nurse manager is supposed to attend it. And anytime the CDC and other things, update comes, the nurse manager is supposed to get those updates and disseminate to the unit. We have an entire new protocol manual for the COVID thing, so if any of the staff, cleaning staff, uh, the engineering, facility maintenance, nurses, or cler clerical staff, anybody needs it, they can go and look at the procedures and proceed accordingly so they don't have to call the nurse every time. Next slide, please. Maintaining the supplies. I think this one is, uh, next slide, please. There is a, many a time I have seen that in Florida, people do not realize that this is a problem. And a part of this, at least especially for us in North Florida, where the COVID in initial phase was not as severe, was that we felt that somehow we were not affected, or many of our colleagues or the nurses felt that they were not affected. The problem in this situation is that the supplies may be coming from far off place, and the supply chain may be affected. And so that's the reason why it is important to make sure that both your PPE supplies and then the patient supplies that go to the patient home are both maintained. So for PPE, uh, I think now we have enough supplies that none of these are currently ongoing and we, we don't have to sort of manage it very tightly. We have adequate supply in stock and the nurses are have a clear instruction that on weekly supply chain, you are allowed to put in additional demand for an extra box here and there, so that they have always have at least two weeks of supply in hand any time going forward. Next slide, please. And for patients' dialysis supply, we make sure that we have at least a month of supply ahead of us. Some of the patients have complained that it takes too much space in their, in their home. And in those patients, we have had to accommodate them by saying that if you need, you can come and pick up from us. But in general, we have now advised that you should have at any given time four weeks of supply in hand, especially now that Florida is getting into the hurricane zone or hurricane season. I think it's going to be very important that we keep this uh, a special attention on supplies. Next slide, please. So finally, I'm just going to tell you about some special situations that we never think about. Next slide. So this is one of my patients, and I can tell you this. So a 36-year-old woman, obviously everything is first here, so that none of this is, so it is basically a completely de-identified patient. So nothing is correct here, but the actual event is correct. This is a 36-year-old woman with diabetes, depression, and end-stage renal disease on stable PD, good residual renal function, prior history of non adherence and especially all the time it was considered to be related to depression. Did not want to come to the clinic for the Marsh Clinic, which was not an unusual thing for her. She does do intermittent phone call with nurses, so sometimes she drops off, sometimes doesn't. Was otherwise well preserved and well managed, so there was no additional concern was under psychiatric care, regular care, we didn't have any concern. And so in March, did not come. And in April, nursing visit, the labs got done. And her creatinine went from 12 to 19, and my went from 23 to 12. She was feeling low, not really well. By that time, the nurses had already told me that the, she's not returning our phone call. So I told them that, please keep calling and tell them that I want in-person visit. So by the end of the April, 
when my clinic was there, they were able to tell her that you just have to come in. She came in. She was feeling down. She was a chef. She had lost the job. Now she didn't have anything to do. She had two kids to take care. Her outpatient psychiatric facility had closed off. And her depression had worsened. And she couldn't really keep herself together. She was admitted. Basically, she came to my clinic, and I realized that I can't let her go. She did not have firm eye suicide allegation, but had thought about it a couple of times. I was able to convince her. We called 911, shifted her to the hospital. She was admitted, and we reinitiated her on dialysis. After seven days, she made full recovery, back to her usual self. Antidepressive medication were adjusted, and now four months into this, she's doing fantastic. Next slide, please. This thing woke us up early in our COVID pandemic. We realized a lot of patients, and that one patient taught us so much. We realized that as we were dealing with these problems of PPE, and supplies, and who is going to come in, and which nurse can come in, all of a sudden, we realized that we were not just responsible for our patients' dialysis. We had to make sure that none of them have lost job. That if they have lost job, that they are not having increasing signs of depression or downward feeling. Especially now, imagine a person on home dialysis who doesn't get out, is told not to get out, and all of a sudden is at home alone, doesn't have any other medical support, None of the other clinics, specialty clinics, are working. And then all of a sudden, the patient's depression goes on. That's a major event. A number of my patients have lost jobs. But since this patient, we have been able to keep talking to them. Not that we have been able to do anything in terms of getting them job back, but at least we are able to keep a tab on them much closer and in a much better manner. Next slide, please. We have had one particular staff who has had multiple exposures. And so this has brought forth a new problem. See, most of the people have started working from home in this COVID era. People who can work from home are the doctors and nurses. So they have to show up for work because the patients are showing up. And when they show up, if one of them or two of them have had exposure at home, that creates a huge problem for ongoing functioning for a dialysis unit. So for example, if the one nurse who was scheduled to train somebody on peritoneal dialysis, all of a sudden had a non-dialysis unit related exposure, calls the nurses that he can't make it. Now, if the nurse can't make it, now all of a sudden the nurse manager has to find a new nurse. And our in-center dialysis unit has multiple such occurrences. Since we share sometimes the nurses with them, our nurses serve as a backup for in-center unit. So one nurse is on the backup for the in-center. The second one cannot come. Nurse manager is attending to the supply chain, and all of a sudden, despite having a big unit, four or five nurses, we were down to almost one or no nurse for training. And that's not feasible for training. So we need to have good protocols how to deal with it. Go ahead, next slide, please. So for our staff exposure, we follow these protocols, and it has been a significant concern, which is not just having COVID in staff. That is by itself a morbidity that our staff has to go through. But not only having COVID in staff, but each time the exposure occurs, how do we deal with it? And in the earlier phase, we had to let the staff go home for almost 10 days or 14 days. Since then, and this is our protocol, we at the University of Florida actually devised this protocol much earlier. The CDC subsequently has caught up with the whole thing. So now what they are saying is that if your patients, if your contact was not close, then you can low risk and continue working. Uh, yeah, I don't have the, I know I'm moving my marker, but I don't have the marker, so I don't know whether you guys can see it or not. 
But essentially, it says that if your contact is not closed, then you go on the left-hand side, and then you continue to this low-risk work. If your contact was high-risk or close contact, then you have to see whether the patient was wearing PPE. The only time we send people home with nothing to know, not to come back without work, is when you have had a close contact, close unprotected contact. If you have had close but protected or not close, protected, I think we can work through if the persons involved people are asymptomatic. Next slide. Once you have elevated risk, then it goes, the, the staff becomes almost non-functional for dialysis unit purpose for next either week or about 10 days. The nine day, day nine, as you can see on the right hand side, the left hand side, the day nine negative test is the one which essentially makes them come back. So till that time, in a close contact, in an elevated risk staff, about nine to 10 days is the time when you are going to lose your staff. And so whenever you have a close contact, you have to have a contingency plan for about 10 days for your staff to come back. Next please. Once your staff is positive, <coughs> there is a different algorithm. The reason why is because some people clear the virus or rather get rid of virus, but are still positive for the test, which means that there is no live virus, but the virus titer keep coming positive on your nasopharyngeal swab. Because of that, there is a separate protocol for return to work staff. If, so what University of Florida, and this is something which is different from CDC recommendations. What we do is that if the staff becomes negative, outside the, so currently CDC allows you more than three days of asymptomatic phase and negative test is okay. Where CDC is a little bit conflicted is more than three days of asymptomatic phase, but positive test. For UF, University of Florida, actually looks at the titer. So our university or our healthcare facility has figured out what they do is that if you have been asymptomatic for more than three days and you do COVID and it comes positive, the infectious disease physician will visit the lab, see the titers of positivity. And if the titers are low, they usually interpret as, low, as less likely or unlikely to be infected. And at that time, they allow people to come back to work. So this is a little bit off from the CDC, and that's the reason I'm not putting it as a recommendation. Uh, Dr. Sharabudi, who is from UF COVID-19 response team, has graciously agreed to give me this protocol. CDC currently still asks for a negative test in more than three days of asymptomatic. Next slide, please. <laughs> I think we can let it go, but this is basically the staff exposed to home person who are actually COVID positive or who have positive tests. And so these are a bunch of ways you can do that. You can refer to it. But again, the essential principle is that Somewhere along seven to nine days, if your test remains negative and you remain asymptomatic, you can come back to work. Next slide. This is a big problem. Patients not being able to connect with us by telemedicine. This is causing, as of now, four months into the whole thing, it's about 10%. The first month, about 50% of people would have a failure to connect with us on Zoom on the first go. We had to reschedule them. Our clinic duration was way longer than our in-person clinic. And then we do a joint clinic, which is a comprehensive clinic with social worker, dietitian, physician, and PA, and nurses together. So we go through each of the aspects all of us together. So it's almost like comprehensive visit 
or rather a care plan visit with patient every month. It helps out because then we can hear each other's concern and provide good care. The problem is when the patient does not connect, it's essentially wasting everybody's time. So because of this reason, all our new training and all our people who were already on 3D on the nursing visit were given a quick training session for telemedicine-based visit. So essentially, we had to do this. We still have about 10% of patients, and we have another two patients uh, who refuse to do audiovisual visit. So essentially, for those people, we have had to do face-to-face -face visit every month. But for most of the other people, we are currently doing well in terms of telemedicine visit. Next slide. I think I have covered this. CMS has multiple, multiple, multiple waivers. It's, it's amazing and it's very impressive as to how quickly the, the, the network and the CMS has advocated for ongoing facilitation of patient care over paperwork. And I think one of the CMS's slogan is patient care over paperwork. So it is truly impressive that in this COVID-19 situation that CMS has waivers for water quality, equipment maintenance, emergency preparedness, maintenance of certification, documentation waiver, care plan waivers. They also have, next slide please, they also have waivers for the how the, even, even the, audio waiver, which is just audio only waiver. They have allowed us to go outside the facility, though we have not done it, but, but they have allowed dialysis unit to go outside and care for facilities which otherwise may not have had a dialysis staff or lose dialysis staff. They have allowed portability of machine, less problem, less of a problem for home dialysis, except where the spouses are using same machine or may need to use the same machine. Again, for Florida and going forward, we do not expect these things to become an issue. And waivers for across the state practice patterns. So it is. it, it truly has been a blessing with CMS. And CMS has done also multiple things in terms of providing guidance for telemedicine and telehealth visit. Next slide. <coughs> I think this is the last slide coming up. Uh, I think I have covered this. You can go ahead. These are some of the things that we can. As a medical director, what do you do? I think uh, in many ways, the nurse manager and medical director's job is like being a mother. Uh, you know, you have to think about everything. Many of my work that I need to pay attention to, I have gone more organic in terms of I have gone through each process, which is the dialysis initiation, training, and ex that's how exactly I sort of spoke about it. Uh, but many a time there are these special issues that evade you, like I told you about that depression. The most important thing that I found that nurses and the staff requires the most is if you can keep patients who are otherwise PUI or infected away from the unit. I think the nurses and the staff appreciate that the most. So what my job has been to figure out the protocols for how to stay, have those people report directly on phone to us and so that we can take them away from home unit and either plug them in with primary care or with healthcare facility. So that the dialysis unit, which otherwise gets only high risk patients, is not exposed to either sick or PUI patient. Other than that, my job has been largely to ensure that for each of these areas that I said, that we have protocols in place. So for good or bad reasons, we now have as thick a COVID manual as we have other manuals, uh, but it allows us to go through each and every process. And it does look like that it was far sighted for us to do that, because it does look like that this COVID situation is not resolving in the next six or seven months. Next slide. I think uh, 
Yes, I covered this. Most of this is this. Uh, yeah, I, I have covered this. So I think most of this is related to, like I said, making sure whatever nurses are going to do, that they have protocol for that. And again, like I said, the majority of time, what I have found useful is what are the places where the nurses are likely to come under stress? Nurses are rarely under stress for patient visit because there are good protocols for that. But their main concern occurs when their patient actually interacts with outside world or their patients have uncertainty. And if as a medical director, you can take that away, that usually gives them the greatest freedom and that in turn allows you to function better. Next slide, please. I think this is pretty much it. Uh, uh, like I told you, there are advantages to home dialysis. But like any natural calamity, there are a lot of precautions and it is easy to miss things. Like in our case, the thing that we missed was the depression in patients, uh, or rather we didn't realize by the time we could get our act together that patients are going to lose jobs and there could be new things happening in their life which require special attention. So that's the only thing. And, uh, we, we actually have been quite lucky that we have one local and one network unit, so we can we can sort of get, use both of them for resources. Anyway, I think this is pretty much it. My next slide is the resources that one could, these are the reliable resources, but other than that, I'm open for questions. Anything that I may have done in last four months, I can help you with, uh, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shukla, for that presentation. And thank you, everybody, for staying on. I know we ran a little bit over. We do appreciate your patience today. Um, and Matt, if you can go to the next slide, I think. I, I, um, and, and the next slide, Matt. Those resources will get set out when we send out the slide deck <clears throat> and will get posted along with the recording within usually a couple, 72 hours. So all that information will be available for, for all the attendees. Um, I also want to mention that we are offering CEUs today. So at the conclusion of this, a survey monkey will appear and you will be able to have the opportunity to give us your feedback and then it will direct you to the CEU links on the learning management system. Just real quickly, I want to uh, just recognize the kidney, excuse me, hub. Um, it's a secure, mobile-friendly web tool for patients and professionals. It was developed by the ESRD NCC with assistance from the patient's subject matter experts. Uh, there's a lot of information on there. There's links to resources about COVID-19, the patient grant library, understanding high kidney donor profile index, and increased kidneys. Um, next slide. And just want to mark your calendar again for the upcoming events. Uh, one is next uh, week. The patient-focused event is Tuesday the, at 4 o'clock, and then the next provider event will be September 2nd at 3 o'clock. Uh, those are Eastern Standard Time. You can also visit the Kidney COVID Info Center for more information and to register. Those are posted on our website. Next slide. And again, I um, thank everybody for attending and staying on uh, for today's uh, webinar. We appreciate it. We hope to have you again on, on our next future call. Dr. Shukla, again, thank you very much for your great presentation and what you've been doing, the work you've been doing there at University of Florida with your home patients and your program. And the use of telemedicine and telehealth is, is very, very interesting. Um, I guess some good things have come out of the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic, at least for, uh, the tele, to, for the telehealth and telemedicine part. So again, thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you, uh, and we'll see you hopefully on a future uh, COVID-19 webinar. <laughs>